base or snare.
Good morning. Welcome to Community Baptist Church. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Good to have you worshiping with us, those of you that are here and those that are watching online. We're going to sing a couple of songs to get started with our worship this morning. The first song you may know well, um, You're My All in All. But after that, we'll sing a song that we've sung once before together, but it's been a little while. It's called Unbroken Praise. So kind of listen in with us and jump in, hang on, do the best you can with that. Um, it's a very worshipful song. Hopefully it'll come back to you when you hear the, the melody of the song. But if you would stand along with us, we'll go ahead and get things started. Sing with us. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Going to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. My 
this morning and think about all that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ and all that God has done for us, then it should not be hard for you to praise the Lord. And it should not be hard for you to sing uh, praises to the Lord. And so we're so thankful that you are with us uh, this morning for our worship service. Let's bow before our wonderful Lord and ask his blessing on our service this morning. Dear Father, what an honor and what a privilege it is for us to gather together in your house with your people today. The opportunity, Lord, to sit here and corporately sing praises to you, thinking of all that you have done for us, Lord. Thank you that you had us in mind when you, in the beginning, Lord, even before we were born, Lord, you provided a way for us to be redeemed, for us to be saved, for us to be rescued by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to the cross, to this world, to live a perfect life, to suffer and to die and bleed and shed your precious blood in our place, Lord. And you've given us this amazing promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. And Lord, that is our hope this morning. Those of us that have made that decision that one day, Lord, regardless of what happens in this world, in this life, that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we will be with you in heaven. And Lord, we're thankful for that hope that you've given to us. And Lord, we're burdened today for those in our congregation as we have some here today who are without Christ, some who may be watching on our live stream broadcast today who have never repented of sins and trusted Christ as Savior. And Lord, we pray for those individuals 
We pray, Lord, that you would work in their hearts and lives. We ask, Lord, that you would open up their minds to understand the truth of the gospel today. And, Lord, if there's someone here without Christ, that you would save them today. Would you do that, Lord? And for those of us who are believers, we ask, Lord, that you would deliver us from routine, that your Holy Spirit would take your holy word, and that you will capture our thoughts and keep us from allowing our minds to drift and wonder and to think about uh, what we're doing this afternoon, Lord, even to let the cares of this life rob us of a blessing this morning. We know we need your help, Lord, even to be sanctified. We need your spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would empower this weak preacher to proclaim your truth. And Lord, that the truth would go forth and that you would accomplish your perfect will for each of us. And that is that we would leave here looking more like our Savior and growing in our relationship with God. Bless those who are traveling, many who are on vacation still. Would you give them safety, bring them back to us. Bless those who are struggling with sickness. Thank you that LaDonna's here today and for your protection in her life on Wednesday, Lord, as she had to go to the hospital. And we just pray for others who are struggling that you would raise them up. Bless this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We do want to welcome you to Community Baptist and, of course, want to give a special welcome to those of you who are visiting us for the first time. Our ushers are coming down front here and uh, with a visitor card, we would like to give you that visitor card, ask you if you'd be so kind as to fill out that visitor card and then drop that in the offering plate a little bit later in our service. And we would sure appreciate that. And so if this is your first time here at Community Baptist, would you just let us know that by lifting up your hand? Just hold your hand up for just one second. And so when, while our ushers uh, see you, and I do want to introduce uh, first-time visitors, Justin. Uh, Justin, raise your hand there. And so, Brother Mike, you can give them a visitor card. Justin and his wife, uh, Katie, I believe it is, uh, visiting with us with their kids. I didn't get a chance to meet uh, their kids, but look forward to greeting them and meeting them after the service. And so we want to welcome Justin and Katie uh, with us uh, for the first time. Also, Michael and Joanna Ransom. I'm not sure where they are. Where did they sit this morning, Michael and Joy. Okay, right here. They have their kids have a couple friends uh, with them today. Uh, Ezra and is it Koa is the name. And so, where are they? Oh, they're there. Oh, you know them. Okay. All right. They came in. All right. So I did meet some of the kids. So I did meet two of uh, Justin and Katie's uh, kids. And so that is uh, Ezra and uh, Koa who are with us today. And so I also met uh, Caleb down front here, sitting down here with Colby and Sean. Uh, he was in our uh, life group there with the single college career class. And so, Caleb, we want to welcome you uh, to Community Baptist. I think this is the first time that he has been with us. And so we want to welcome him. A couple folks uh, you're getting to know. Um, also, before I forget, uh, Barry and Carissa Bradshaw uh, are with us again. Barry, raise your hand back there. This is the Nelson's uh, uh, daughter and son-in-law, and most importantly, their little granddaughter. Who? Uh, when was she born, and what's her name? Layla. So we want to welcome Layla to Community Baptist Church, right? Congratulate the Bradshaws. And so good to have them with us. Uh, of course, uh, uh, they uh, were here uh, for a short period of time serving the Lord as he is a youth pastor there up in Michigan. And so good to have uh, them visiting back with us. And of course, good to have their little girl uh, visiting with us as well. And so they're friends. Uh, you're getting to know uh, Mickey. I saw Mickey. Mickey, raise your hand. I've uh, been visiting our church for a number of months. Mickey got saved. If you remember when we had, had the coffee team here a few years ago, had the big uh, dodgeball tournament. I think he got saved that night. And so it's good to have him uh, with us today. Also, Trey and Courtney Lewis. Trey, raise your hand back there. They've been visiting with us. Their son, Elliot. Uh, good to have them uh, back with us again as well. I saw Michael and Kathy Peterson. Where, I don't know where they were sitting. Uh, they're over here. Uh, good to have them again. All these families are praying about whether the Lord would have them unite with our church. Uh, Chris and Michelle McGuire, uh, where are they back there? Chris and Michelle, their son Archer, their new little baby as well. And so good to have them uh, back visiting with us. And so you're getting to know Alvin and Tatiana. Alvin, raise your hand. I see them. They've been gone for a couple of weeks. And I was asking about you guys last week. And so good to have uh, them uh, back with us again as well. And so um, I'm trying to make sure 
that I'm not uh, missing anyone. Uh, Dorothy King, uh, Dorothy, raise your hand back there, sitting behind Tassa. I haven't introduced her in a while, but she's been so faithful. And uh, in fact, uh, used to go to Friendship Baptist Church. Of course, you know, well, I went to school there and graduated from there. And so we know a lot of the same people. And so, but I haven't introduced uh, Dorothy to you. So good to have Dorothy uh, King uh, visiting with us again as well. And so um, I think that's all of the uh, visitors I'll mention today. A couple of announcements for you. First of all, uh, so uh, excited about, um, I, I guess I'm still excited about jumping into the youth group. Uh, Nancy and I, and uh, we are jumping in to uh, take over the youth group for a short period of time. I'm going to be uh, teaching in there um, for life group and then Wednesday night, so I hope you'll pray for me. Some of you have asked, we will continue the parenting class. Uh, I've asked my brother Phil and Bill Buffalo if they would uh, jump in and help uh, to complete the parenting class on Wednesday. So still come. The parenting class will start back up this week on Wednesday night, and then Pastor Gene will be having his Bible study as well, the characters that he's studying in the book of Genesis. Genesis, and so I hope you'll be here. And so uh, Nancy and I have asked uh, Mandy and Casey, uh, where are Mandy and Casey uh, here? Uh, just over here to be uh, youth sponsors to help us. And then uh, Daniel and Jessica, where's Daniel and Jessica Lifer? They're in the back, back there uh, to jump in and help us uh, with the youth group. And so we were all in there this morning. We had, uh, I cheated on my diet and had some really good uh, uh, sweets this morning. And so we had food and so excited. We had 18 uh, in the youth group this morning and uh, some, some new teens that uh, came. Uh, Luke, uh, Luke, uh, Luke and Savannah were able to be there. And uh, they gave testimonies, and we shared our heart and some things about them. So parents, hope you'll plan to have your teenagers here on Wednesday as I will begin this Wednesday night uh, going through a series. I'll spend the next four to six weeks uh, talking about really some steps to Christian living and just some things that the Lord has uh, burdened my heart with. And then on or next week during Life Group, uh, I will be starting talking to our kids about uh, what the Bible says about how to make godly decisions and some principles there about what, how to make godly decisions as well as how to know the will of the Lord. I want to talk with them about that. And so that's kind of where I'm headed over the next few weeks. And so hope you'll pray with us as we seek uh, a new uh, youth pastor, assistant pastor. And so we already have some really good uh, contacts that folks that we're contacting and interviewing and praying about. And so I uh, hope you'll have your teenagers here next Sunday. Uh, just a reminder, I'm mentioning life group, but next Sunday we actually have a combined life group. And so even with the teenagers, because I want our teenagers in here to hear Dr. Josh Crockett, who is the new president at Bob Jones University, will be speaking for us. And so all of our adult life groups and our teenagers will be here in the auditorium at 9 o'clock. I've asked Dr. Crockett if he would share his testimony and a little bit about how the Lord led him uh, to be, uh, leave his pastorate. He was pastoring a, a church, a large church there in the Greenville area, Morningside Baptist Church, and he left there to, to become the new president at Bob Jones. And so he'll be sharing his story. Also, parents, those of you that may be praying about and teenagers, maybe attending a Christian college, really want to have him talk about you know, some advantages of Christian college is really his burden and his vision for leading uh, Bob Jones University. And so he'll be with us for life group. And then in our morning service, he will actually be preaching for us. And so all of you will get a chance to get to know him. And so I hope that you will plan to be here next Sunday for this uh, special occasion. And then some of you have contacted me. Uh, others, I'm still waiting on you to confirm. But uh, August the 4th is our next baptismal service. And that will be across the street uh, at 2.30 in the afternoon. And so I'm so excited. I think we have maybe 13, 15 or so that have trusted Christ in our ministry here in the last year that are wanting to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. And so if you want your kids uh, to follow the Lord in believers' baptism, if you could just text me or shoot me an email just to remind me that I'm not missing anyone. And then several of you have talked to me about meeting uh, with your kids that want to be baptized. Some of them I've led to Christ. And so I like to meet with the kids to make sure that they understand what baptism is all about. And so kids, if you've been saved and you've trusted Christ and you haven't been baptized and you want to follow the Lord in believers baptism, you don't have to get baptized in order to be saved. But you, in order for you, uh, it's something that God wants you to do as an obedient Christian. And so then you let your parents know and you let me know 
And uh, I know that some of you, some of our kids were talking to me after the service uh, last Sunday. And so wanted to mention that to parents of our kids, our Connect uh, uh, 412 will be back in action this Wednesday as well as uh, Justin and Amy will be back. And so just everything normal, really, uh, this Wednesday night. And so let me read a couple of thank yous. First of all, uh, it says, Dear CBC family, thank you all so much for the farewell ice cream social. Your love kindness means so much to our family. Thank you for all the encouraging words and prayers. CBC will always hold a special place in our hearts. We love you all and will continue to pray for God's blessing on the CBC ministry. Love, Pastor the Hospital. And so praise the Lord, she's here today. And so LaDonna, we're glad you're here. And Jesse's back in town, but they're just expressing their thank you for those of you that have reached out to them and encouraging them. I hope you'll continue to pray uh, for her as she deals with these health issues to figure out exactly what's going on. And so a uh, couple other folks that uh, I wanted to, to mention to you, uh, Zach and uh, Georgia Francis, I see them back there. In fact, Nancy and I are going to lunch with them today uh, to meet with them. And so also uh, I wanted to introduce uh, John uh, Barbas and uh, Thelma Smith. John, raise your hand back there. I see them. Thelma, raise your hand. And they've been visiting with us for a number of weeks as well. And I appreciate their faithfulness uh, to our church. And so with that said, um, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Chris Underwood. Uh, so thankful for Chris and Erica that volunteered to take our juniors to camp this year. And so they had, I think it was 13 of our juniors that they took to the Anchorage this past week. And Chris took off and Erica, they took off uh, work in order to uh, minister with our kids. And so Chris has put together a little video that captures uh, the week of camp. And so I think these guys have that video ready we want to show you a little bit about what happens at junior camp. And then, Chris, if you'll come, I'm going to have him say a word, and then he'll lead us in prayer for the offering. So when Chris comes, then men, you can come, and we'll move right into our offering. So enjoy learning and seeing something about junior camp. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it.
Come and sing your praise For the Lord now reigns On the throne of grace Soon is the day He will bring us home And we have this hope For we are A, uh, we had a fun week at the Anchorage. If you don't know where that is, it's at Lake Waccamaw. If you're headed to Myrtle Beach and you're on 74, it is probably a mile off of Interstate 74, about an hour outside of Myrtle Beach. Uh, Whiteville would be your closest town. So we had a we had a great time. Um, the campus camp is unique, where you get to get away from screens, you get to get away from TV and anything that um, is a part of our daily life and part of kids' daily lives, it seems like. And when you strip it down, it just, you get the camp life. When you take all this stuff away and you get to community and you get to God's word, and that's what this whole week was focused on, is time of fellowship with each other and fellow campers and uh, really diving into God's word and these kids, um, you know, making decisions to uh, take God's word seriously and get into God's word, uh, not only for the week of camp, but hopefully as they leave camp, um, going forward. So we had a great time. Thank you for um, sending your kids with us and allowing us to go. Uh, it is it is it's quite fun and it's quite fun to be around a group of people who are just literally that's what they're there for is to have so much fun. Uh, the Anchorage does a great job as does um, obviously the Wilds and we kind of alternate between those two every couple of years. So just wanted to uh, say thank you. Hope you enjoyed the recap video from this past week. Let's uh, bow before the Lord in prayer. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for a week of camp where you can slow down and realize um, what we're here for, God, and that's to honor you and to glorify you and to, um, and to praise your name, God. And I just pray for these kids that went to camp and the other ones that are here that did not go to camp, God. I just pray that we would get in your word daily, God. We would live for you. Thank you that when we, when we strip away all the busyness of life, God, we're left with uh, fellowship and we're left with you, God. And we just thank you for that. Thank you for that reminder. Pray that that would, reminder would live on past just one week of camp and would carry forward um, each and every week, God. Pray that you would bless this offering and bless the message to follow. In your name we pray. Amen. As followers of Christ, we have victory over death and hell. We have victory over our sin, over ourself, and we have victory over Satan, all because of what Christ did on the cross. So we're going to sing about it this morning. Would you stand along with us? We sing Hallelujah for the Cross.
Amen. Thank you, uh, Kimberly and Garrett, for that reminder of the mercy and the compassion of God. When you think about and understand the mercy and compassion of God, I'm not, it should motivate us to live for God. In fact, I was thinking as they were singing that song of Romans chapter 12, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to him, right? And so you think about that verse, it says, Paul says, I beg you, now that you know you're saved, in Romans chapter 12, based on the mercy and the compassion of God, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God. And so what he's saying is, what should motivate us to surrender our life and separate ourselves and serve God today is the mercy and the compassion of God. Were you motivated by that as you heard that song? Aren't you thankful for the mercy and the compassion of God? And so thank you so much for that special. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. While you're turning there, it's good to have Ken and Fran's two granddaughters with us today. And I can't remember there. Is one of them Gabby? Ariana and Gabrielle. Okay, good to have you guys. I couldn't remember both of their names, but good to have them uh, visiting with them, them and visiting their granddad and grandma uh, here this morning. And so great to have you guys at Community Baptist this morning. And so I was really challenged this morning in our teen life group, just having the rest of the teenagers that weren't here this past Wednesday night as they shared testimonies of being at the Anchorage and then some of our teens went to camp at the Anchorage, and then they left uh, Monday and went to the wilds for another week of camp. In fact, one of our teenagers, Elijah Matthews, Kimberly, who sang the special, her son, uh, he is uh, he, uh, up at the wilds for, for another week at CIT. And so, uh, and so we had them this morning in life group, those that weren't here on Wednesday night, share uh, their testimonies. Some of them sharing their testimonies about being at camp for two weeks now. And so I don't know, but I was really, really challenged by their testimonies. And, and Luke uh, really challenged me. Luke Diamond was there in life group this morning. And he went to a different camp and was sharing with us this morning as I had him give a testimony about how the Lord is really moving in his heart, possibly to go into full-time ministry. And so, Luke, that was an encouragement to hear you testify about that this morning. And so I don't know about you, but isn't it encouraging to see and hear God working in people's lives. No matter where you go, guess what? God is at work. And the church is always moving forward. And I was sharing with the teenagers this morning that, you know, if you're a Christian, you should always be moving forward. There's no standing still in the Christian life. You're either moving forward for the Lord or you're backsliding. You can't just stagnate. You can't just stay there. And so uh, I hope that you are moving forward. If you're not moving forward, then we're going to leave you behind here at Community Baptist because we've always got to keep moving forward for the Lord. We are in this, uh, God's will is that we would be sanctified and that we would be set apart. And that means every single day and every single week and every single month, you ought to get sweeter and more patient and looking more like Jesus. And if that's not you this morning, because you're backslid, you need to get right with God. So I'm glad you came this morning so that you can get right with God. I've asked you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you're visiting with us, we have been teaching and preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, due to the sake of time, and I know I, my time is even shorter this morning, I uh, appreciate Chris and Erica uh, going to camp and putting together that little video. Uh, and so I'm glad we were able to show that, give you a glimpse of camp. And so... I'm going to skip some of my introduction here. The last time we were in 1 Corinthians, you know, uh, Paul was talking about, the title of my message was God's building the church believers. And we saw that God uses humble people, wise, humble people to build his church, God's building. We learned that Jesus is the only foundation for God's building the church. And then we were reminded of the importance of us um, Building, God's building the church with the right building materials, 
of silver and gold and precious stones as we were reminded that one day we as Christians will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the end of my message last time was really Paul's focus on the judgment seat of Christ. And I reminded us that the judgment seat of Christ is not a place where we will be judged for our sins. And sometimes it's misunderstood because Christ bore the judgment for our sins. Aren't you glad? And if you're here and you're saved and you've trusted Christ as your Savior, then your sins have been forgiven past, present, and future. You say, what's the judgment seat of Christ for? It is the place where we as Christians, those of us who know Christ, will be rewarded for everything that we have done for Christ with the right heart attitude. Now that's the key, with the right heart attitude. Because we can do things publicly that supposedly are for Christ, but you do them with the wrong motivation and God sees that. And so then in verses 16 and 17, Paul reminds us that we are God's building, the temple of God, because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And therefore, since the Holy Spirit lives in us, we should live holy lives for him. And Paul then ends this chapter, which is what I want us to deal with today. By telling us how to avoid division and disunity in the church. Remember in chapter 1, he started talking about one of the main sin problems that the Corinthian church was dealing with. And that is that there were cliques, that there were divisions in the church, that they were exalting some Paul above Apollos and some Paul above a follower of Apollos. Some were followers of Paul. Some were followers of Peter. And they had all these cliques and all these divisions. And so if you went to the church of Corinth, it was not really a friendly place uh, for, to go to church, which is a lot of churches in our day, because you had to fit into these little groups and it was cliquish. And we should never get that way. And so Paul continues to deal with that as he goes through chapter 2 and chapter 3. And so our text for this morning is found in verse, verse 18. You follow along as I read. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We'll pray and we'll dive right into this passage. Paul says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age... He must become foolish so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. So then, let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All things belong to you, the Bible says, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Let's bow for prayer, and we'll dive into this passage. Dear Father, you know we need your help this morning. The Holy Spirit of God is the one that illuminates us. And open up, op opens up our hearts and minds to understand the scripture. And Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we continue to talk about the dangers of disunity. The dangers of sowing discord. The dangers of divisions that can easily happen in a church like ours, Lord. And I pray that you would keep this from happening at Community Baptist. Lord, I pray that you would continue to give us unity, which is what you're talking about in this passage. And Lord, I pray that you would convict us where we need to be convicted and encourage us where we need to be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. This text, again, draws our attention as we have preached in the last few months on the importance of of unity in the church. Do you realize the importance of unity? I talked about the church is always moving forward, but you know one of the greatest things that hinders churches today is disunity. If you don't have unity, you can't move forward. In fact, you know one of the things that's really hurting a lot of the churches in America today and across the world today is we refer to them as church splits. And I've been in churches where they've had a church split. How many of you have ever been involved in a church where there was a church split? Raise your hand. I mean, a lot of you raise your hand. Very difficult, right? Now, there are all kinds of reasons why churches split. Now, sometimes there's a good reason to split. 
because the church or the pastor may not be doing things according to the Bible. And I'll go back to that a little bit later in our message. But a lot of times, I think what the devil does is he, he, he causes all this little disunity, this discord amongst believers to stir up trouble, to hinder the church of God. And it's very, very dangerous, by the way. I remember when I was at Bible Baptist, we went through a church split. Church used to be about 600. I think after it was all said and done, there were probably about 200 people that ended up leaving over a period of time. And I remember when we were in the middle of this church split, and it was really caused by, uh, I shouldn't give you any more details because someone may be watching this video, and so maybe I shouldn't get into any more details, but I'll tell you, it was over something crazy. Something that really Christians should not fall out over. And I remember sitting in the uh, deacons meeting and with our staff and my pastor reading a letter from one of the other men in the church who was uh, another pastor and evangelist. And he was the one that was kind of stirring up the trouble. And basically he read a letter and he basically said to my pastor, either you stop doing this or you stop doing what you believe you're doing or you are in for a fight. And that man and his family, they're in heaven now. He's in heaven now. I believe he was a believer, but I think that he did great damage in some of the things that he did. I remember standing on the, the soccer field. Uh, we had a Christian school there at Bible Baptist, and we were, uh, we were standing on the soccer field, and we were right in the middle of this church split. We didn't know how many people were going to be, be fall for it and get involved in it. And I remember when my pastor came, he put his arm around me, and I said, how's it going, pastor? I said, what's going on? And he was kind of updating me on where things were, and it was really, really volatile at the time. And I'll never forget it. He looked at me, and he says, well, he said, he said uh, when it's all said and done, it may be just you and me and what we're going to do. We're going to keep soccer. And I remember I looked at him, I said, I'm with you, Pastor. I'm behind you, Pastor. And boy, did we, we did over the next few months and years what we were in for. And you know what? I look back at that situation and I learned from that situation. And God used it in my life. But I saw how silly things can be to stir up God's people to really damage the work of God. You know what? May God spare us of that here at Community Baptist. You can't move forward if you don't have unity. I want to preach to you a message this morning that I've just simply entitled, How to Stop Church Splits. Now, listen, I'm not preaching this message because I'm nervous about us having a church split. I'm preaching this message because this is the next text, the Bible. Because people leave oftentimes, they'll say, Pastor, how did you know that about me? I said, well, I didn't know that about you. God knew that about you. That's why I preached that message. And so this is just the next text that's here uh, before us today. And so I want uh, to point out several things to you as it relates to unity in the church. The first thing that Paul says is stop thinking you are wise when you are foolish. You say, how do you church full of disunity and discord and people that cause divisions and ultimately sometimes end up splitting the church and maybe the church doesn't split where people leave but maybe you come to a service like this and certain people are sitting on one side of the the the, the audience there's division among those people well that's a church split because there's no unity that's involved here well the first thing i want you to notice is paul says this look at verse 18 he says let no man deceive himself if any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age he must become foolish so that he may become wise and i want you to notice the word deceive he says let no man deceive himself now listen to what i'm getting ready to say this is really important for you to understand the word is naturally deceitful and wicked right the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then he, Jeremiah asked this question, who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And so we know that man's heart is naturally deceit, basically can trick you or mislead you. And so let me tell you how tricky your mind is times have you come to church here and topic of that was that that it was preaching on and actually I challenge you specifically hey are you struggling with this in your life and you sat there and you think even church splits we must stop lying to ourselves 
So how do you know if you're lying to yourself? When your thinking and your actions don't line up according to God's Word. Now follow me. Because there are a lot of churches that are off kilter today. You know why? They were deceived into thinking that they should do things this way or they should do things this way. And they got away from the Word of God and the Bible. And all of a sudden you go in those churches and things that the Bible says are wrong are accepted. Maybe it's just a spirit. Maybe it's even the spirit of just division or disunity or the spirit of pride that's there. But they have deceived themselves into thinking that this is okay when it's really not okay. And so Paul says to these, the, church, the, the believers in the church of Corinth, he said, let no man deceive. And notice what he says, himself. Now, I don't know about you, but if I... If I when I think about false teachers or when I th- think about teachers that are deceiving people, you know, all the churches that are right now telling people that you can get to God any other way but Jesus Christ, they're deceiving people. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. And you must repent of your sins and by faith trust him as your Savior or you're not going to get to heaven. But there are all kinds of pastors out there that are deceiving people that you can get to God through the sacraments. You can get to God through giving to their church or you can get through, through, to God some other way. I don't know about you, but I get worked up about that. You know what? You know what you ought to get worked up? You ought to get worked up when you deceive yourself. Are you following me? Whenever you make excuses for your sin, and Paul says to us today, listen, Christian, the way that you stay unified, and I think not only in the church, human wisdom reminds us of what he's talked about in, in chapter one. Human wisdom is not God's wisdom. Look at the text. He says, let no man stop lying to yourself. If a man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. And I want you to notice a phrase, which is why this point is in my outline. Look at it again. He says, if any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age. You see that phrase? Well, in this age refers to this world. If any man thinks that he's wise, referring to this world, or wise in contemporary human wisdom. And so what he's saying is, is if any person thinks that he is wise in his human wisdom, remember what Paul has already taught us in chapter 1. That human wisdom is different than God's wisdom. And we don't have time to go back and turn there. But we learned this a number of months ago when we were in chapter 1. You remember what Paul reminds us about human wisdom? I preached two messages on human wisdom versus God's wisdom. You remember that? And in chapter 1, Paul reminds us, listen very careful, carefully. He says in verse 17, human wisdom always makes God's wisdom, the gospel, ineffective. So you have human wisdom versus God's wisdom. Where do we find God's wisdom? In the Bible, right? Where do we find God's wisdom? Ultimately in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he's the only way, the truth, and the life. And so human wisdom always makes God's wisdom, the gospel, ineffective. Verse 18 in chapter 1, he says, human wisdom always makes God's wisdom, the gospel, seem foolish. And so if you rely on human wisdom, thirdly, we learn that human wisdom will one day be destroyed and those who follow it will perish. Why? Because they don't accept the gospel. Verse 20, human wisdom does not have the answers to man's problems, Paul tells us. Remember what we said about that? What's man's greatest problem? Sin, man's greatest problem is he has a heart problem. Now listen. You need to be reminded of this. Your greatest problem is you. Yep. Jesse, you. There you go. Point themselves. You know what we all want to do? No, pastor. My greatest problem is you. Point to me. And you preaching like this to me. Or my, but you, you need to be reminded of something. You know, Your greatest problems are not around you. Your greatest problem is within you. Are you following me? And so maybe it will be good for us 
to preach to ourselves this morning. Instead of me doing all the preaching, why don't you help me preach to yourself and let's say it together. And if you really believe it, if you don't believe it, don't just say it because I'm asking you to. But if you really believe that I'm teaching the truth and that this is what the Bible says, then say it with me. And I want you to say with me, my greatest problem is me. Can you say that? All right, let's say it. My greatest problem is me. Now, I wanted to say you. Right? Man, that would really help our marriages. That would really help us as parents. That would really help us to be unified. When you recognize that, you know what? You should spend more time worrying about you than everybody else. So this message today is for you. It's for me. It's why I try to preach to myself every single Sunday because I realize that the greatest problem with me preaching is me. This is what Paul is trying to teach us. He says that human wisdom does not have the answer to the man's problem. You know why? Because human wisdom doesn't deal with the heart. You know what God's wisdom does? It deals right with the heart. So you see, God changes the heart, and then he changes the actions and behavior, right? He saves the person, but the devil works opposite of that. Paul says, also, remember what Paul taught about God's wisdom. That same chapter, in chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, we learn, but God's wisdom, on the other hand, the gospel, has power to save. Number 1, verse 18. Secondly, God's wisdom the gospel teaches that man cannot come to know God through human wisdom or human effort. Verse 21, verse 21b. God's wisdom the gospel saves though who, those who simply hear about Christ and believe in Christ. Verses 22 and 23. God's wisdom the gospel condemns those who refuse to believe. Regardless of their response, our responsibility is to share the gospel with them, but God will condemn them. Verse 24, we learn that God's wisdom, the gospel, saves all those who call upon God for salvation. And then finally, we learn in verse 25, God's wisdom, the gospel, shows the transcendence of God over man. If God was foolish or weak, which he is not, by the way, his foolishness is wiser than man's greatest wisdom, and his weakness should, it would be stronger than man's greatest strength. You know why? Because God is transcendent over us. And so, really, what the emphasis in this text today is the same emphasis Paul started in chapter 1. And he's basically reminding us that God's wisdom is his word. God's wisdom is found in the pages of this book. And so, when Paul says to us, if any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, what he's talking about, if any man thinks that he is wise by pursuing human wisdom, what's human wisdom? Human wisdom is the opposite of God's wisdom. So if anyone thinks that He's come up with a better way to raise their kids than God. Then he's foolish. If there's another way of marriage other than a man and a wife, then that's human wisdom, right? If someone's calling what God says is wrong, right, and what God says is right, wrong, then that's human wisdom. Are you following me? So human wisdom is God's wisdom. And Paul says, if any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age with human wisdom, notice what he says, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. And so there is, in order to become wise, I'm putting it this way, this will really make you feel good. You must admit that you are a moron. Should I have you repeat that? That would be really good for us to repeat and for us to say, you know, in order for me to become wise, then I've got to become a moron. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning so that the pastor could call you a moron? You know what? I didn't call you that. You know what? God calls you that when you try to live your life and you try to do things uh, contrary to his word. You know what? It's nothing short of moronic. You say, well, where do you get that, pastor? Well, you know what's interesting is I get that from God's wisdom. The Bible, look at it. Paul says, if any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age by human wisdom, 
he must become a moron. The word foolish is the word moros. It means absurd. It literally means stupid. Or we could say it this way, you are a blockhead. This word is where we get our English word moron. You say, Pastor, where do you get your outlines for your messages? The Bible. Isn't that the best place, right? You're taking notes. Wouldn't you want to take notes on what the Bible has to say? A form of this word is also used in verse 19. Paul uses this word back in uh, chapter 1, verse 25. Back in chapter 1, verse 27. He uses it again in chapter 4, verse 10. In order for a person to become wise, are you listening to this? What the Bible says and what Paul reminds us of here, he must understand and admit that his wisdom, his opinions, his ideas are moronic. Or foolish. Any wisdom contrary to God's wisdom found in his word is foolish and moronic. Any of our thoughts and actions that are not in line with God's word are foolish. And we must admit they are, are, are moronic and we must turn from them. So you know, what's, you know what's moronic? You know what's foolish? It's for a teenager to get involved in a relationship with someone outside of marriage and have sex outside of marriage. That's moronic. In fact, the Bible says that every sin that a man commits is outside the body, but he that commits fornication hinders his own body. I mean, that, 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 that raises that. Do you know what it is? Well, you know, to convince yourself that it's okay to have sex outside of my, my marriage, you know what? You need to understand that is so foolish and that's so moronic. Are you following me? I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous, foolish, and moronic for someone to think that, you know, it's okay for a man to be with a man and a woman to be with a woman. Why? Because the Bible says that that's an abomination in the sight of God. It's not okay. It's an abomination in the sight of God. And so the world that's telling us these things are okay, I'm telling you, the Bible says that's foolish. You're acting like a moron to live like that. For you to allow yourself, even as a Christian, to deceive yourself when you are selfish and proud and away from God. And somehow for you to convince yourself that you're okay and this super Christian person and everybody ought to bow to you. That's nothing more than foolishness and moronic. So what we have to admit is you know, a lot of times we're a bunch of morons. Right? So Paul's challenging us, like, stop thinking you're wise when you're foolish. I mean, own up to it. Stop lying to yourself. Understand that human wisdom is not God's wisdom. In order to become wise, you must admit that you are a moron. And look at the text. Fourthly, what does he say? Verse 19, he says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. So the fourth thing, human wisdom is moronic to God. So... Not only should our sin and our own way and our own selfishness and doing things the way that we want to do things contrary to God's word, not only should we understand that it's moronic for us, but we need to understand that God views it as moronic. And that's what he's saying there is human wisdom is moronic to God. And so what does he say? Look at it. He says, for the wisdom of this world is moronic before God. It's the same word for it is written he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasons of the wise, that they are useless. And so, uh, fifthly, those who live by human wisdom will be judged by God. And what's interesting here is Paul quotes a verse from Job. Job chapter 5, verse 15. And basically, the, the verse that he's uh, quoting, it says, And he is the one who who catches the wise in their craftiness. And so what is he saying here? God will catch those who oppose his word in their own traps. An illustration that I think of when I think about that is, is Esther, the book of Esther. You remember the story of Esther? Haman tried to kill and hang Mordecai on the, uh, the gallows, right? You remember that? 
And what happened is he was all crafty. He was trying to get the best of them. But God was sovereign. Him was on Esther and the Jewish people and Mordecai. And so what happened is this, this came, to, came to roost in, in uh, Haman's life. And at the end of the book of Esther, you see what happens. The very gallows that he prepared to kill Mordecai and the, the Jewish people the, the king said to them, you hang him on it. You know what happens when you and I try to live our own life and when you and I try to, you know, even in the church, spiritualize things that aren't really true or get worked up about things that really don't matter is not only do we become moronic, but you know what's eventually going to happen? God is going to ensnare you in your own snare. We try to deceive ourselves and we try to deceive other people and we need to realize that, you know what, this is not without judgment. Now, as a Christian, you won't be judged for your sin uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. But let me tell you something, as I pointed out when I was talking about the judgment seat of Christ, if you get away from God and you start, you know, living according to human wisdom and you start excusing things, even in the church, that are wrong whenever they're right, then let me tell you something, God loves you enough, he's going to judge you in this life. He will chasten you. He's not going to let you sin and get away with it. And I'm telling you, to mess with the church of God is serious. Stir up trouble in a local church and to hinder the body of Christ. Let me tell you something. You're going to help be held accountable for that. And what I say about that, no, your sins are forgiven if you're a believer. But let me tell you something. There are people that I think have lived a lot shorter lives. You know why? Because they have tried to hinder the work of God very serious thing then he quotes from a second verse look at verse 20 he says and again the lord knows the reasoning of the wise that they are useless and so what does he say here not only those who live by human wisdom in the church will be judged by god but human wisdom is completely useless the word useless means devoid of truth it means uh, devoid of success devoid of result it means vain empty or it literally can mean this way no purpose So, how do we apply this? The spiritual opinions, the ideas, the reasonings of someone who is not living for God, who is living in human wisdom, are useless, they're vain, they're empty, and they will accomplish no purpose. Do you know what it means? Waste of time. That's what happens. You know what? I'm looking at a bunch of people, and you know what? You've wasted a lot of time in your life. Teenager, don't waste your years as a teen. I was challenging the teenagers on Wednesday after the testimony time. Let no man despise thy youth. Don't let anyone look down on your youthfulness, but you be an example. In word, in conversation, in, in spirit, in faith, in purity. You let people look at you as a teenager, as a young man or a young woman. And you know what? Don't let them look down on your youthfulness. You live for God now. You make your teenage years count for eternity. Don't wait till, like some of us waited, to get serious about living for God. And all of a sudden, you know, you spent your college years on the party scene. And you know what? You live like a moron. And you live foolishly. And you have scars to this day to prove it. Am I right? If you've lived like that, could you say amen? Many of us have lived that way. And you know what? We've already wasted too much time. To live for this world and to live for yourself and even be a Christian and to live away from God and to make excuses for your sin and your selfishness and to deceive yourself and keep going. You know what? It just means that your works will burn up one day and they are entirely useless for God. What unifies the church? I'm only going to be able to get to one point of my message today. How is it that this happens? What unifies the church of God and keeps us from dividing? You know what it is? It's God's wisdom, the glorious gospel, found in God's word. But when we get away from God's word, then we will have strife, in division, 
And you know what? Not only in church, but in your family and with your spouse. And you know what it does? It splits people. We start thinking and acting according to our own ways of doing things. And we quickly, quickly become disunified. And you know, pride, really, is always at the heart of human wisdom. Proverbs 13, 10 says in the King James, I like the King James because I have it memorized, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. You know why you have divisions in your, with your relationship with your spouse? is because you're proud. You know why you have uh, divisions sometimes in your family, all family goes through it? You know why? Because one sinner is married to another sinner and then you, had, you gave birth to more sinners. And so it's like, what do you expect? You're living with more people in the home, and then you're going to have more kids. And you're going to complicate the process because now you just brought into the world another pagan person. That has a deceitful heart. And so, no wonder we have problems and we know that only by pride cometh contention. So why do you have divisions? Why do you have disunity? You know why we have disunity? Because every single one of us wake up every single day wanting to go our own way. Right? I'll close with this. A well-known Arab proverb says this. I'll put it up here because I want you to think about it. This proverb is so good. It's not Bible, but this is a good proverb. It says, he who knows not... And knows not that he knows not is a fool. You're like, but what? Look at it again. He who knows not, this may be you. And knows not that he knows not is a fool. Shun him, the proverb says. He who knows not and knows that he knows not is simple. You can teach a person like that, right? You know what you look for in a person who loves the Lord and has the spiritual wisdom? You know what one thing you look for in your own life and in the lives of other people that you want to hang around is humility. You can't live for God if you're proud. In fact, the Bible says that God resists the proud, but what does he do? He gives grace to the humble. If you want the grace of God in your life, if you want the favor of God in your life, if you want to come to church and really grow in a message like this and really grow here at Community Baptist Church, then you know what? You humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and you recognize that you are nothing without God. The only good in you is Jesus Christ. And you know what? Recognize that you are a sinner and you are struggling and your heart is deceitful and desperate really wicked and you may be here today and think you're okay and waxing eloquently spiritually and you are way away from God humbly admit that and understand that sadly there are many intellectuals and spiritually proud people in the church who have exalted their opinion above God's opinion this always causes strife and division in the church MacArthur said it this way, when the truth of Scripture is not the sole authority, man's varied opinions become authority. And you know what happens when man's varied opinions become authoritative? There is strife and there is division. The way to avoid disunity in the church, disunity in your marriage, disunity in your family, is for us to first to stop thinking we are wise when we are really Foolish. You know what unifies the church of God? Is a renewed, common commitment to God's word. And so I ask you today, only one point I got through. But I'll stop here. Are you living a life of a fool? As a moron? Are you a moron? 
Are you wise? Every head bowed and every hand closed. This is kind of a tough sermon to give a raise of hand invitation. But I'm not asking you to admit to me whether you are moronic in your thinking and in your actions. I'm asking you to evaluate between you and God whether you are. All of us have lived foolishly. All of us have allowed pride to set in to sow discord and cause disunity. You're here today and God has convicted you and spoken to your heart. Would you just do business with God? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to show your hands if God has convicted you. But you say, Pastor Mike, I'm here today. And you know what? I have deceived myself. I have made excuses. And the Holy Spirit of God has convicted my heart about something in my life. Or I know that there is something in my life that I am doing, that I am holding on to, that is clearly not right with God. And I realize today that I am moronic and foolish to keep living that way. And you know what? I want to get it right. And I want to have the wisdom of God. Would you take me? Would you do business with God in the quietness of this moment? Maybe you're here today and you're without Christ. Well, you you don't have wisdom because you don't know the God of wisdom. Say, Pastor Mike, I'm here today and there's never been a time in my life where I've repented of my sins and trusted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Well, you know what? We want to help you. We want to introduce you to Christ. And the first step is you admitting that you are unsaved and that you need Jesus. You say, Pastor Mike, I'm here today and I know I need Christ as my Savior. I'm thinking about it. Would you pray for me? The quietness of this moment, would you just lift up your hand and say, Pastor Mike, I know I need Jesus. I know I need Christ. Would you pray for me? Anybody like that? Anybody at all? Anybody at all? All right. Thank you so much for coming. Lord willing, if he tarries, maybe he'll come back. We won't have to worry about completing this sermon. But wouldn't that be great? But uh, week after next, we'll look back at this text and finish this section. I'm trying to look around for the greatest moron here to close us in our service. And so, Alex Dunn, there you go. Alex, would you stand and close us in prayer today?